This video begins the last concept in this unit of molecular geometry by discussing the topic polarity. We'll separate the polarity discussion into two major parts. In part one, we're going to define what polarity is, and we're going to talk about a specific type of polarity known as bond polarity. Here is a rundown of uh, what's going to happen in this video. Uh, we'll start by reviewing some of the necessary components. You can't understand polarity until you understand Lewis dot structures and Vesper shape. These reviews are not meant to replace the videos on these two topics. If you don't feel comfortable with either of these, please go back and watch that video first, but at least we'll refresh your memory as to what Lewis dot structures and Vesper shapes are. Once that's done, we'll dive right into the concept of polarity. We'll first start by defining what it is. We'll then dive into a concept we talked about last unit, something known as electronegativity, uh, which is the chemical property of a substance that determines whether a molecule is or is not polar. Last but not least, we'll talk about bond polarity itself and the ability to predict that polarity. We'll end the process then with an example that gives you a chance to see this process of predicting bond polarity in practice, and then we'll continue the practice process in class. What we're going to get is, again, a continued addition to the stuff we've already talked about. And right here we can see the Vesper shapes of a couple different molecules, uh, CF4, carbon tetrafluoride, and CHF3. Um, the colored areas around the molecules themselves represent the density of electrons. And we can see in the molecule above with CF4, we have an even distribution or density of electrons with these red areas representing high densities that are evenly distributed. And down here with CHF3, we have an uneven distribution of those electrons. We've got this location here at the top of the molecule that has a very low density of electrons. This creates this characteristic of polarity, which as you've learned in earlier classes like biology, creates a positive and negative side of the molecule. Our job in this video is to be able to identify which of these two cases is the scenario for our particular molecule. Um, so let's get going. So to start off, again, a quick review of Lewis dot structures. You've seen this discussion a couple times now. Uh, if you feel comfortable, you can skip ahead. If not, this will refresh your memory as to what's going on. Uh, again, um, Lewis dot structures are designed to predict connectivity in molecules, what's connected to what, uh, how the atoms are connected together. It does not give us any information about the shape of a molecule. We can therefore, with a Lewis dot structure, go from the formula CH4 to a map that shows us that the four hydrogens are connected to a central atom carbon. And that's what Lewis dot structure does for us. We then continue the process with something known as Vesper theory. It converts the two-dimensional Lewis dot structure into the three-dimensional representation of what the actual molecule looks like. It's based off of the fact that atoms repel against one another and arrange themselves as far apart as possible. Whatever that arrangement happens to be is what the three dimension of the molecule will actually turn out to be. A Vesper theory then starts with a Lewis dot structure like the one we had in our previous example and converts it into a three-dimensional model of what this compound would actually look like. And we get the tetrahedral shape that is very commonly associated with carbon being a central atom. Polarity is a characteristic of covalent compounds that have positive and negative poles just like a magnet actually does. Now we normally think of positive and negative poles as being ionic compounds, but this also can occur when there's an uneven sharing of electrons across a bond. Yes, the two atoms in the bond are sharing the electrons, but that doesn't mean it's an even sharing process. Now this does not create full charge particles like we would see in an ionic bond. Full charges suggest an actual gain or loss of an electron, uh, which creates that ionic bonds. This is just uneven sharing. So it's a world that kind of lives between a covalent bond and an ionic bond. This uneven sharing is determined by the electronegativities of the individual atoms involved in the bond. Uh, it's a force we're going to talk about in a moment, and by looking up the data associated with this force, we'll be able to determine whether this uneven sharing is happening or not. So let's dive into the idea of electronegativity then. Uh, we talked about this last chapter, but as a quick refresher, it's an attractive force that an atom exerts on a shared pair of bonding electrons. Each atom in every bond, and there's always two of them, pulls on that shared pair of electrons. 
and an atom with a larger electronegativity is going to pull harder on that shared pair of electrons. If you recall from previous chapter, uh, we talked about the fact that electronegativity has a very predictable trend as we move around the periodic table. And this can be a valuable tool for figuring out information about which guy has the larger electronegativity. If you recall, which we can clearly see from this graphic, as we go across the periodic table left to right, electronegativity increases. As we go down the periodic table top to bottom, electronegativity decreases. Sometimes this is enough information to determine bond polarity, other times we'll actually have to look up data. So let's dive then into the main topic of this video, which is something known as a bond polarity. Uh, bond polarity is determined by the differences in electronegativity values for the two atoms in the bond. Uh, this causes uneven sharing of electrons and it causes the creation of partial charges on each of the atoms in the bond. We can visualize this by thinking of a bond being created with two fictitious atoms. Atom A chemically bonded to atom B. We can draw the electrons for atom A and B that they're sharing, that they use to complete both of their octets in the Lewis dot structure. Uh, and then we can start looking up information about their electronegativities. For example, we might find out that the electronegativity of atom A is relatively large, whereas the electronegativity of atom B is relatively small. That means that the force pulling on these electrons towards atom A would be very strong and the electrons would be pulled in that direction, whereas the conflicting force from atom B would be relatively small. This difference in forces is going to create a situation where the actual sharing of this elect pair of electrons here is going to be uneven. We can depict that by drawing the same bond again, A bonded to B, but in this time we're going to draw that shared pair of electrons very close to atom A and further away from atom B. This means that those electrons are spending a large amount of their time over here of chemical a, or element A and a small amount of time of chemical B. If you think about electrons again as orbiting the molecule, you can think of these electrons as spending most of their orbital time traveling around atom A while only occasionally traveling to the other side of the molecule to orbit around atom B. Again, lots of time here orbiting A and only occasionally orbiting atom B. What this creates is what we call partial charges. Because the electrons spend the most time around atom A and they have a negative charge, we would describe this side of the molecule as having a partial negative charge. This lowercase Greek delta letter is what we use to denote partial. This side of the molecule, which doesn't see the electrons very often, is going to have a partial positive charge. And this positive and negative side of the molecule is what creates the polarity of this particular bond. We would expect electrons to be pulled in a net direction towards atom A with the positive side over here by atom B. So now that we have an idea of what bond polarity is, let's talk about the actual process of predicting bond polarity. And the great news is this can be done by following a couple quick and easy steps. Once you've identified the bond you want to work with, you can start by looking up the electronegativity values uh, for each of the individual atoms. Uh, some periodic tables will actually have this data located on them. Uh, if your periodic table does not, there's a link to the bottom of the page of a website uh, that lists electronegativities for all elements on the periodic table. That'd be a great web page to find to have this data handy. You're going to then calculate delta electronegativity. This is going to be the difference in the electronegativity values for each atom. Doesn't matter which one you go in the direction, I typically try to set it up so that I get a positive answer, but at the end of the day, we only want to know how different those two electronegativities are. We talked about earlier that if those electronegativities are different, they cause the molecule to have this characteristic of polarity. So what's going to happen next is we're going to compare our value for delta En to a chart that's going to identify the type of bond we're dealing with. It's either going to be a nonpolar covalent bond a polar covalent bond or an ionic bond depending on how big this value of delta E and is. The more, the larger it is, the more and more we're going to get shifted in this direction towards ionic. Last but not least, we're going to draw an arrow 
that is pointing in the direction that the electrons are being pulled. This is going to denote the polarity and it's going to denote a force vector acting on those actual electrons themselves. So before we jump into an actual example, uh, I wanted to show this particular image here. This is a basically a depiction of the cutoffs in delta En that would be necessary for the different bond types. So this electronegativity difference is really your value for delta En. When you look up your two individual atoms, you'll subtract, the part, you'll subtract them from one another. If that difference is less than 0.4, we would think of our molecule as being nonpolar. It's not a big enough difference to cause a noticeable shift in electrons, and as a result, you get even sharing. If that difference is greater than 0.4, but still less than 2, we would expect you now to have a polar covalent bond. Uh, this is a significant difference in electronegativities. It does cause this uneven sharing. Notice in this case, the electrons are getting pulled over here to this side of the molecule, and you're getting your partial negative and partial positive charges. One last step in this then, if your differences in electronegativity are bigger still, bigger than two, but less than four, the end result is, is now the electron sharing is so uneven, you've created an ionic bond instead. There's no more sharing of electrons, and we get a full transfer of electrons over to the negative ion, and they get lost from the positive ion. This is a chart, and these cutoffs are the numbers you'll use for your delta En values to ultimately predict whether your bond is or is not polar. But it is an also neat picture to denote the fact that while we used to think of bonds as being one or the other, polar or nonpolar, we can actually see that bond characteristics exist on a spectrum. There is very covalent bonds, there are very ionic bonds, and there's a whole world of stuff in the middle. And we could even get more specific than just these three cutoffs here and really start breaking down something that we would describe later on as percent ionic character. But that's a conversation for another day. So let's wrap this process up with a pair of examples really quickly to show you how this whole thing works. Uh, for example, we can predict the polarity of a carbon and sulfur bond. Uh, and if you recall the steps, the first order of business is to look up the electronegativities of the individual elements that are here. Uh, carbon's electronegativity is 2.55 Paulings, the unit of electronegativity. Uh, and sulfur's electronegativity is 2.58 Paulings. Uh, if you calculate the difference or the delta En between the two of these, you'd find out that it's 0 0.03. Paulings. Uh, compared to our scale, we know that the difference has to be greater than 0.4, so we would say that this bond is non-polar, and we'd be done. Let's take a look at a second bond then, something a little more interesting here. Uh, again, to predict the polarity of this bond, we'd say that carbon's electronegativity is 2.55 Paulings. Uh, however, fluorine, being on the top right corner of the periodic table, actually has the highest electronegativity of any element, and that is 3.98. Uh, the scale goes to a maximum of 4, so you can see how fluorine has a pretty darn strong pull on electrons. Anyway, we can calculate the difference in those electronegativity values really quickly with the calculator and find out that that difference is 1.43. This value is larger than the 0.4 cutoff, but still less than 2, telling us that this would be a polar covalent bond. We would expect then the electrons to get pulled in the direction of the larger electronegativity, the stronger force, and we would denote that by drawing an arrow towards the fluorine like this in the same direction that the bond goes in, and we put a little slash on this side to remind ourselves that this is the positive side of the molecule. And that's pretty much it. Uh, at this point in time, you should be able to define what the concept of polarity in a compound is. Uh, you should also be able to define, now that it's the second time around, the concept of electronegativity. Uh, its definition should have been a review. Uh, but its relation to polarity is clearly new material, and you should be able to explain that relationship. Uh, last but not least, you should be able to predict polarity across a chemical bond. Uh, and that's as far as we've gone so far. Uh, part two of this series of videos on polarity will then continue this process for us to predict polarity across an entire molecule, which is arguably much more useful than bond polarity.